Hi there, my name is Martin, and today we're looking at mushrooms in the neighborhood, and in fact, in my neighborhood. And my neighborhood is in Devon, Alberta, which is in central Alberta in the parkland ecological re region. And if your if your neighborhood looks anything like the photo here, um, you might be finding similar mushrooms. So these uh, this is basically a park, a grass uh, grassland across the uh, the street from me and along the river valley where we've got lots of uh, aspens and poplars and stuff like that encroaching on the edge. So the first mushroom that we found during this uh, mid-June week, and actually I will say June is a lousy time for mushrooms. Usually um, we end up looking at the flowers rather than mushrooms. They seem to seem to not come up, even though we we'll, might find some oyster mushrooms and things like that. Um, of course, not growing out in the grass, but um, that's that. But this year, because of the uh, heavy rain and also because of uh, the cooler weather, I think we're seeing a lot more mushrooms fruiting. So the first one uh, that I want to show you is, is a little puffball that I found. So the puffball um, is actually an edible mushroom. So it's one of the reasons it's at the top of the list here, because I know... Um, a lot of people are interested in the edible ones. It's actually also a medicinal one. You could use that white sterile flesh that you're seeing there as a uh, as a compress, as a sterile gauze, um, if you've cut yourself. And the ancient peoples used to do that. They also used to use the spores to help uh, help the wounds clot and and uh, and stop bleeding and staunch the bleeding. So um, actually, good edible, good medicinal mushroom. Um, so the one I have here, I'm naming it Calvatia giantia. And uh, the thing when you're looking at puffballs, um, there's a couple of things you need to have in mind. One of the first questions is, does it have a sterile base? So in other words, some puffballs kind of sit on this base and, um, and they usually have a thin skin and, uh, and sometimes a little pore in the top. Sometimes the skin just peels off and... and uh, and every time a raindrop hits or the wind comes along, it starts dispersing, dispersing the spores. This one didn't have that. Um, this one was attached to the ground by a mycelial thread. And uh, so these are ones that, that, uh, that a lot of times the wind will blow and actually have them bounce along across the prairie. And, uh, and disperse their spores with every bounce that, that goes along. One of the also important things is to look at the skin on the puffball. So in this case, we can see we've got a really thick skin. Um, and some of them have a really thin skin. Typically, the ones that sit on a pedestal have more of the, the, the thinner skin. So this one has a really thick skin, and sometimes actually the skin ends up cracking up. And when you look at the puffball itself, you can see that it's got kind of what looks a little bit like plates across it. And, um, and sometimes these things will end up, as they get big, actually forming big cracks, kind of like you see with dried up mud um, on a mud flat. Um, and they look fairly similar to that. Um, I'm guessing that this one is... Calvatia giantia. My two choices were Calvatia giantia or Calvatia booniana, the western giant puffball. And uh, I choose, chose giantia, well, because it grows in little damper conditions and, and the western giant puffball, the booniana, typically grows in a little bit more arid areas. And I'm thinking, eh, it you know, we're a little damper up here, um, so it might be that one. If you're down in Calgary and southern Alberta, it's a good chance you're going to have the Booniana. Also, the Giantia has a really smooth skin, and this actually had a really super smooth skin. Now, for me to actually tell what this was, I'd have to wait, uh, you know, a week or 10 days until it matures, and we can actually see what the final shape looks like. Um, that's always a problem with mushrooms. Sometimes when you get little ones, they're not fully mature and you can't get all the information. So because of that, I put the CF in. So a lot of times you'll see this in all kinds of uh, in scientific literature. And what the CF means is to confer. So what the author, 
this case me is trying to say is, I think it's that one. I think it's Giantia, but it might not be. And I'm willing to confer on that. Or sometimes it means, gosh, it looks completely, com it looks a lot like it, or it looks quite a bit like it. Uh, might not be it though. So we're saying, hey, that's what it kind of looks like today. And, uh, and we add the CF to it and uh, just means that we're not completely sure. The next one actually that I want to bring to your attention is another tremendous edible mushroom. So um, here we've got the Merasmus oreades, the fairy ring mushroom, that's its common name. And basically it was growing in the fairy ring that you see in the photograph in the center. Um, mind you, within that fairy ring, there was a bunch of other mushrooms and other mushrooms growing in that. Uh, in that. So while the fairy ring grows in fairy rings, it's certainly not the only mushroom that grows in fairy rings. So it's really important that actually you take a close look at what the mushroom is. So when we pick these ones, of course, they're kind of off-white um, and you turn them over, the gills are kind of off-white to beige. We're looking at how the gills attach to the stalk. And in this case, the case with Merasmus oreades, the gills are, are usually touching the stalk. They're really close. But as the mushroom dries out, the gills will kind of pull away. So it kind of may look like they're free. So one of the things when you're looking at these, you know, you want to look at several, several of them. Now, luckily, that's the only, that's not the only thing that defines them. The other thing to look at is the stem and the stem is really tough. Um, and it's flexible. And generally, it's not edible because of that. Um, and at times I've been able to, with a fresh specimen, I've been able to actually tie these in a knot. So they're not fragile, they don't break just by nudging them. But the big thing is, is looking at the gills. So again, the gills aren't getting off colored. Um, so when you take a spore print, you'll find that, uh, that the spore print is certainly light to white. Um, and, but looking at the gills, the gills are really thick and they're widely spaced. And in between the gills, there's what's called intermediates. So this is what we're looking for. You, so you see these all the way along. We see the big gill and we see an intermediate here and another one there. And uh, this gives you a fairy ring. So with these things growing in grass and uh, with the tough stalk and the, uh, and the kind of white, light beigey nature of the mushroom gives you Merasmus oreades and this is a really good mushroom to eat it's also the quintessential prairie mushroom because you know when the weather changes and it gets hot and dry these mushrooms will actually shrivel on their stalks but when the rain comes again they'll rehydrate and they'll continue to grow and keep on growing it's one of the few mushrooms that uh, in fact it's the only mushroom I know that'll that'll do that so Merasmus oreades, and a little bit early. Typically, we find these find these uh, in July and through the rest of the summer. But mostly, uh, that's when we see the big boom boom of them. But uh, so finding them this early in the year uh, was a bit of a surprise to me. So here's another one. So carrying on with the grass theme, here's a beautiful little Bulbidius vitellinus, and uh, these are tiny little tiny mushrooms, uh, maybe two and a half inches tall, and, uh, and they're delicate, and they quickly dry up. So when I go back the next day to look at this mushroom, um, it's basically shriveled up and gone. So, so you have to have your camera with you when you're out there, because otherwise you'll miss the opportunity, and you'll go back the next day and say, ah, darn, you know, miss the opportunity to take a picture of this one. Um, Vitellinus or Bulbidius vitellinus is in the Bulbataceae, which are um, kind of, <clears throat> which are a lot of which typically grow in grass. And, and we're going to see a couple of them here. Um, the spore print is kind of reddish brown. Um, the vitellinus means egg yolk color. And so when you look at the, the mushroom cap, that's exactly the color that it is. It's the color of an egg yolk. Um, though sometimes, well, like a boiled egg yolk, it'll turn a little green. Some of these turn a little bit green as well at times. So uh, I 
think that might be a variety because you certainly don't see that very often, but, uh, but it is known to happen. So carrying on in our grass, here's a really important one to know. Um, this is uh, Conosopy siligmia, and it looks really similar to another one called Conosopy tenera, which is a little bit bigger mushroom, uh, mushroom. So basically, the two of them look pretty much the same, um, except on the siligmia, the cap doesn't get any wider than about one centimeter. So, so two and a half centimeters and an inch. So, you know, just under half inch wide. And when I look at them, I look at a bunch of specimens, not just this one. So I'll look at the other ones growing around it and kind of get a general size. And, and if all of them are smaller, it's going to be this one here. And the salignia actually means uh, slender. And uh, the other one, the tenera will grow up to four and a half centimeters, which is huge. I've never seen one anywhere that big, but I've seen one that's twice as big, which I would have named uh, Tenera for sure. Conocybes are important to learn because there's some of these conocybes have deadly amatoxins in them. So this potentially is, and I don't believe Saligny is, but these aren't a family where that are really hard to tell apart and you have to be careful that uh, that you certainly don't eat them because they're a risk of uh, of getting really really sick. I mean, you're not going to eat uh, die from eating one mushroom because the dose is way too small. But uh, but you can certainly do yourself uh, mischief. Here's another one, actually in uh, in the same group, um, Paniolus campanulatus. The uh, so this is a, a dung-loving mushroom, but in some cases, and, and in the case of, of this one here, it's actually growing deep in grass. So typically it's dung in grass, but a lot of times you don't have to have, have dung on the field. There just has to be presence of, of manure around and you'll get uh, great big clumps of these paniolus. Uh, now paniolus campanulatus is the old name. I use the old name because uh, that's what you most everybody's going to find in field guides. So that's fine. So the mushroom formerly known as paniolus campanulatus. And it's also kind of lumped together in a group because there's a lot of different species of these. Well, gee, I shouldn't say a lot about uh, four or five different species that kind of look fairly similar and they're really difficult to tell apart until you start picking it apart and looking at it with a microscope. So we're kind of naming it in the group. The other time, the, the other way you often see this in, in uh, mushroom literature is uh, it'll call, be called Paniolus campanulatus sensu latu. And what does that mean? That means in the broadest sense, in the most lateral sense. If we're talking this Paniolus campanulatus and we knew exactly what this was, we'd say it would be sensu strictu in the narrowest sense. So those are kind of terms that watch out for. And uh, when you see them, you might remember. And uh... But anyways, tall, thin mushroom. The big trick here is to look at the gills and you'll see that kind of mottled black on it. And these ones have black spores. And so you see that mottled black across the spore and that's one of the dead giveaways for these uh, paniolus. The new name is paniolus papillonaceus. Um, and uh, some people pick these because they are known to be potentially hallucinogenic with uh, with some psilocybin compounds. Um, I've tested a whole bunch of these and actually brought them into a lab in, uh, and had these tested for, for, uh, for psilocybin and everything came back negative. So um, we haven't found any here in Alberta, but, but these ones are known potentially to have some of those compounds. Again, if you are picking for that reason, um, be very careful because they're growing in areas where you see the paniolus or where we see the conocybes, but they're really quite radically different if you look closely. If you're just grabbing and shoving them into a bag or a basket and not taking a close look, you could get yourself into a big bunch of trouble. So here's another one, and, and this is this is one I love because as you 
walk around, you see them growing in rings and, and in areas where fairy rings are. And, and you think, oh, look, there's a nice big fairy ring mushroom. And then I go and pick it and hold it up and I take a look underneath and, well, it doesn't have that thick stalk, that thick, tough stalk. It doesn't have the wide gills and the gills are off color. And when we, let me just go back to that. When we look at this, we can see that it has a ring and we also have veil remnants along the edge of the cap. And in fact, these veil remnants, both on the stalk and the cap, are catching the dark brown spores. Of course, our fairy ring mushroom is, uh, has, uh, has kind of light, white, beigey spores. So this certainly isn't one of those. Um, and again, when we look at the older one, the one down on the, uh, on the lower right side, um, it looks a little bit like an agaricus. Um, or a portobello, like basically a tall stretched out one. And, uh, and so a lot of times that's how I kind of keep them in my head. The big difference here, of course, is, is that the agaricus or portobellas have, have way more crowded gills than even here. Um, here we see again the, uh, the intermediates. But the big thing is, is that these gills are sinuate. In other words, they're notched as we approach the cap. Um, so these are notched gills um, with a uh, dark brown spore print. And these guys are agrocybes. And so one of our spring mushrooms, um, and it kind of looks like a tall stretched out, stretched out um, agaricus. There's another one called agrocybe praecox. Um, these ones are a little bit smaller. Um, and the other ones, those ones are a little bigger and typically they come a little earlier in the year. They're a, a really true spring mushroom rather than heading off to being a midsummer mushroom. Another one that we found, and this actually found in a number of places on my walk, um, right along the edge of the woods, uh, we found these and growing in grass, both of them, and also beside a tree that's been cut down on our front boulevard, a big big old poplar and uh and when we look at them look at the look at the difference these are all the same species um and and generally these two were growing within about a foot of each other this one here the the, the lower picture that's just a younger specimen and it looks quite different from the one above it which is the older specimen so a lot of times when you're identifying mushrooms, you need that little bit of aggregation of ages to be able to kind of pin this one down. So this is the Satharella candeliniana and uh, Satharellas are really difficult um, to identify and they're really, really brittle. So by the time you pick them and you've put them in a basket and taken them home, uh, they're generally crunched up and, and you don't have much of a specimen unless you're, you're bagging them individually. Um, the, uh, in fact, when I took a picture of, uh, of the older one, I was just pulling some of the grass out that was in front of it to take my picture. And I just nudged that mushroom and it broke in half. And, uh, so the stalks are really, really fragile. Um, and this mushroom, this mushroom is probably two and a half to three inches wide in diameter. When we look at the one on the left-hand side, um, we can see the discoloration in the center of the mushroom. And uh, typically this is what, what the term hygrophonous means. So once it's been rained on or had dew on it or any moisture, it'll discolor. And when you look at the center, you'll see it end up going back to white and actually more of an opaque white. Um, so this is a kind of changing nature of of this mushroom and uh, and it changes as the weather changes. I'll bring your attention to the to the lower right hand one. You can see the veil remnants along the side of the cap, so that's important. And here, if you're taking pictures of mushrooms, um, this one was growing underneath one of the other mushrooms, and we end up having that dark dark brown satharella spore print on it. So this is a great picture. We see the top, we see the habitat where it's growing. We see the spore print, we see the gills. And uh, so this is satharella candeliana. 
the next one, when I found this one, I thought I would have a, uh, a big inosity, you know, the, one of the fiber caps, and which generally look kind of like this, the edges of the caps crack. And then I picked it and it was white underneath. And uh, because inosities have kind of a clay brown spore color, um, you know, the gills end up turning brown and brown in maturity. And, uh, and we could also see spore prints on the leaves and, and on, on the mushroom caps underneath. And here we're all white. Um, when I first looked at it and I looked closely at it, I was surprised. So what is this? So when you look here on, uh, look closely at the gills, you'll notice how the gills kind of go down the stem and they kind of notch again. So these are sinuate as well. So a white spored notched gilled mushroom a lot of times, or most of the time, I find is a uh, is a tricholoma, and uh, so for example, if this was a pink spored mushroom, I might be thinking entoloma. So if I have pink spores and notched gills, I'm thinking entoloma. If I have a pink spored mushroom and the gills are free, not touching the stalk, well then I'm thinking pluteus um, or a deer mushroom. Anyway, so this is a tricholoma. Um, and a lot of tricholomas, you'll see this kind of growth habit too, where the where the caps have this kind of striations, a little bit, a little bit like the uh, inosibes, like the fiber caps. We see that in the tricholoma um, uh, vaccinum and the tricholoma virgatum. They look very much like this. Also, when you pick this mushroom, smell it, smell it, and taste it. Um, these are important characteristics. Um, we have white tricholomas that are named tricholoma in ammonium, and it just reeks. Um, we also have the pine mushroom, which is a tricholoma, which has a pleasant smell. So a lot of them have pleasant smells. This one didn't have any pleasant smell, any smell at all. Um, also tasted a bit, and it basically had no particular taste. When you taste, you can always taste just about every mushroom. Um, taste a little bit see what it tastes like, roll it on the tip of your tongue, and then spit it out. Um, the, initially, this looks a lot like Tricholoma cingulatum, but cingulatum has got a veil on it. So it's one of these little Tricholomas that has a veil. This one doesn't, so it's not that. And so it kind of falls into a, another kind of big group. Again, we're using the word sensulatu or CF. So I think it looks like a tricholoma terium. Teriums are a little bit more gray. And actually in this mushroom, when I picked it, it did look a little gray. The photos have just kind of washed some of that grayness out. Um, so they can be gray, solid gray. Um, they can be gray with bits of brown in it like this one. And this would be a very, very light gray. Um, tricholoma terium, there's a, there's a lot of different species in that group so and they're just being sorted out so right now we're kind of lumping them all together in this sensu in this big lateral wide sense sensu latu uh, in the widest sense this is a tricholomaterium and finally actually this one's well not in my neighborhood in devon this is in my neighborhood in grand cash um, walking through the woods and uh and we have these beautiful little cup fungi and, uh, and you have to know the substrate that it's growing on. And in this case, it's growing on a piece of bear tongue. So I was kind of excited to see these lovely little cups on, on the bear dung. Um, I won't even comment if it's edible or not. Um, to find out exactly what we've got, um, I'm pretty sure it's a pseudo ombrophila. Um, there are ombrophila mushrooms. Phila, of course, means to love. Ombro is the rain, so it's a rain-loving mushroom, but this one actually is the false, the pseudo, the false rain-loving mushroom. And the one that I came closest to was Dorada, um, but I'm not completely confident of that, so I certainly put that CF in there. Um, I'd, have to, uh, I'd have to collect it and take a look at the spores and, and, and the microscopic structure and, and get a better analysis on on what's going on here and or maybe even take the dna you know we uh with these little guys you know there's lots of unnamed mushrooms and uh and it might be something that's that's unique but uh there we have it pseudo ombrophila 
C.F. Dirada. And that's, that's basically it for my week of mushroom picking. And, uh, but what hopefully we're going to do some more of these. I'm going to try and do them uh, every week, 10 days or every two weeks, and basically take a look at the mushrooms that are just in my yard and in my neighborhood and share them with you and, and, and share on how you can identify them. Um, as many of you know, I'm a home inspector, but I've been doing mushrooms for a long time. I'm about to retire. And uh, so I'm going to do this a little bit more seriously. And uh, we're going to be coming out with a website fairly soon called Martin on Mushrooms. We're going to have a forum in there where you can send in photographs and we can have some in-depth discussions on how to identify these. And also I might include some of these in a little workshop like we're doing today. I'm going to be blogging on all kinds of mushroom topics and doing videos like these and, and ones out in the field. And also uh, looking at doing a bunch of different courses. And, uh, and we'll see that develop over the next year. So um, hopefully uh, you'll come and visit me when that all happens. And in the meantime, you can reach me at Martin on Martin on Mushrooms. Um, so drop me an email and uh, and hope to be talking to you and seeing you in the future. Thanks so much for uh, for watching this. Hope you enjoyed it.